In a much discussed interview with The Atlantic magazine last week, President Obama unloaded on a number of American allies, including Britain and France, and it's turned into a full-fledged PR crisis for the White House. So what's the fallout, and where does it go from here? Let's talk about it with our good friend Mark Ginsburg, former U.S. ambassador to Morocco. He also served as President Carter's deputy senior advisor for the Middle East, and he's currently CEO of PeaceWorks Foundation and the One Voice Movement in Palestine and Israel. Okay, what do you make of this? The president uh, hitting hard at David Cameron over his handling of the problems in Libya. Larry, I was uh, spent enough time in Libya, spent enough time in North Africa, and read the Jeffrey Goldberg's piece in the Atlantic magazine over the weekend. Uh, you were a good friend of Rodney Dangerfield, and this is a Rodney Dangerfield uh, foreign policy expose by the president who's just decided to unload on everybody and anybody as a result of his own failures of leadership in foreign policy in the White House. And it's a great, it's a, it's a really great case of revisionism. Look, uh, when the expression leading from behind ever hit our lexicon, it was largely because uh, the White House had indeed deferred to both Britain and France in the efforts to overthrow Gaddafi back in 2011. However, they may have contributed a great deal on the front end, but the United States more or less abandoned the entire enterprise after Gaddafi fall, fell. So uh, with all due respect to the president, he can't have it both ways. He can't blame Mr. Cameron as well as the French for the failures of the United States to pick up the pieces of the China that it helped break. But his, his uh, the president seems to be saying is based on their proximity to Libya, it was more their problem to handle than his. Well, you can make the argument, sure, proximity being the case, then where's Italy and where's Spain? And where are the other countries that are part of the southern flank uh, in NATO? Look, uh, Larry, the fact of the matter is, is that insofar as the military efforts to overthrow Gaddafi, the United States provided the air cover that was necessary to make it easier for British and French warplanes to support the rebel movements across the eastern part of Libya to Tripoli. However, however, once Gaddafi was murdered or assassinated, everybody walked away. It was not just Cameron who walked away or the, and the French and Sarkozy. It was also the United States. Uh, the president almost broke his arm patting himself on the back for doing such a great job in Libya after Gaddafi fell. Uh, but he also was very critical of Sarkozy, saying that uh, he tried to claim the spotlight, that he wanted to trumpet the flights he was taking in the air campaign, despite the fact the United States had wiped out all the air defenses. What about his criticism of France? I, I, listen, I'm not going to quarrel with the president about his assessment over the actual military campaign that was uh, largely given the French a free ride onto not having to put any of its jets over Libya that would have been in harm's way. I agree with that. I mean, the, the president is right. But, but Larry, the, the problem in Libya arose not as a result of what took place in the air over Libya and the United States' involvement at the before Gaddafi was overthrown. The real problem was that uh, there was no American leadership or British leadership or French leadership to try to make sure that a transitional government emerged in Libya that would, in effect, prevent ISIS and al-Qaeda from establishing bases in what essentially has been a hugely chaotic state. I remember writing a piece in the Huffington Post right after that 74 tribes inside Libya are going to all vow vouch for their own needs, their own goals and welfare, their own control over the oil, their own control over Tripoli and Benghazi. And that's exactly what's happened. Uh, it was once again a failure to understand what is really lies at the core of the biggest problems we face in the Middle East, and that is doing our homework. Give me a little history here. I interviewed Gaddafi, I think, in 2009. I thought things were going much better between Gaddafi and the United States. What happened? They, w they were indeed. Isn't it ironic, Larry, 
that back in the, uh, back in the uh, uh, early 2000s, the Gaddafi began signaling to then Prime Minister Tony Blair that he wanted to rebuild ties with the West. Larry, I personally was invited by Gaddafi and his head of intelligence to travel to Libya in 2006 to brief them on how to proceed with establishing diplomatic relations with the United States at the time that he was then surrendering his nuclear arms program voluntarily in order to accomplish that. Condoleezza Rice went then to Libya. We then wound up being able to have, uh, to obtain from him his nuclear weapons program, which was then decommissioned and sent to Tennessee. Uh, he became a darling of American businessmen. And what happened was that the Arab Spring began producing agitation within the area that is most Islamist in Libya, and that is in Benghazi. And so he had a small rebellion on his hands and began, in effect, doing, to a certain degree, a far less degree than what Syria's Assad is doing today. Well, that was enough for us to believe that he was going to commit a massacre of, uh, of Libyan civilians at the very time that he was most be willing to rehabilitate himself in the eyes of the West. Did we overreact? I believe we did. I believe we did. I believe in the end we had to understand that regime, his regime control was essential, but at the same time, we needed to understand that those Islamist uh, uh, powers in Benghazi that were determined to overthrow him for decades were now being able to gravitate allied supporters result of their latching on and parasiting on to the movements inside, the, inside North Africa that constituted the Arab Spring next door in Egypt. Do you agree with President Obama's assessment that the European and Gulf countries were calling for action against Gaddafi, but they wanted us to act and they were unwilling to put any skin in the game? He recalled them free riders. Uh, I yeah. I, I, listen, I think the president, to a certain extent, is right about, uh, about Arab states. The Arab League had more or less ditched Gaddafi completely. Libya was a pariah state within the Arab states. The Saudis, the Egyptians, Mubarak, everybody had more or less uh, refused to, in effect, deal with him for decades. And when it came to providing the support that was necessary to stabilize the regime, uh, the Qataris, the Emiratis, and the Saudis, and all of the others ran for cover. When, and basically, look, it's always the same situation, Larry. Look, it's going on in Yemen. It's going on in Syria. Everybody wants to push the Americans forward to do the dirty work that they should be doing themselves, which is why I've always argued with you, as long as I've been on your show, that the United States should not be putting ground troops into Syria. That is not our job, and it is not our core interest in the region. But the Republican candidates, maybe Kasich holds back a little, seem to all support boots on the ground. Are they wrong? Well, look, if we understood that our number one goal is to get rid of ISIS, which constitutes increasingly a challenge for, American, for the American homeland because of its terrorist threats and its ability to, in effect, radicalize Americans as well as to promote regional terrorism, fine, we get it. Uh, if, if indeed uh, Mr. Obama had been less reluctant to, provo to provide forward air traffic spotters on the ground several, months, several years ago when he was urged to by his own Pentagon, he wouldn't be in a situation right now so much where he's having to fend off calls for more boots on the ground. As it is, Larry, we've got 3,000 boots on the ground in Iraq right now that are fi providing support for Iraqi military operations against ISIS, and the president has secretly put more boots on the ground. Look, our strategy needs to be to help get rid of ISIS as a military threat and force the Arab states to do their job. And yes, we can do it. We're not doing it. Is there enough talk in the Republican debates about foreign policy? No, unfortunately not. Everybody has more like they're using cliff notes, Larry, uh, to deal with very complex subjects. And the fact of the matter is, is I really feel it's so important for them not to just throw glib lines out to basically say, oh, we're going to defend Israel, oh, we're going to get rid of ISIS. The, the situation in the region is cries out 
for a bit nuance and understanding and complexity. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many, how many pieces of hair or shreds of hair I pulled out of my own scalp listening to them talk about or, or decry Obama's foreign policy without offering up a coherent, thoughtful presentation to how to keep the Americans from getting more dra dragged into uh, uh, proxy wars in the region, but defending our core interests. Frankly, isn't Hillary the only one really discussing foreign policy? Yeah, and frankly, Hillary understands the region far better than anyone else. I mean, she if she had had her way with this Obama White House, I guarantee you things would have been far better when she was Secretary of State. She was pushing for much more uh, thoughtful policies in the Middle East that were rejected by the White House national security staff under Condoleezza Rice and the other underlings who have no experience in Middle East diplomacy. What in all of this world, traumatic world, what worries you the most, Mark? Well, I know that our military commanders fear Russia the most, but I'll tell you what I'm most concerned about is the loss of admiration and respect that our adversaries and allies have for the United States. You know, I know the president came into office with such high hopes and expectations, and yet when you look around the world, there's such a, there's a palatable belief that the United States has withdrawn from helping to activate the most important elements of its global role in the world, and that's not military. It's, it's our leadership. It's our capacity to gravitate and grab a hold of people by the scruff of their collar to try to do the most right thing that's necessary. Look, I applaud Secretary Kerry. He's done an incredible job obtaining the ceasefire with the Russians in Syria. Uh, and he's been basically the cleanup man on a, on a game that was beginning to run out of innings. And so it's unfortunate that his time in office is limited because he certainly has thrown a, heart, a lot of heart and soul into getting the Iran agreement, getting the Syria agreement, and ceasefire. Uh, frankly, who else would have been doing this if it wasn't for him? Mark, it is always great having you on. It's a pleasure talking to you. Your knowledge sure. is tremendous. We always love calling upon you. I'm grateful, Larry. Always good to be with you. Ambassador Mark Ginsburg, the former U.S. ambassador to Morocco. He was President Carter's deputy senior advisor for Mideast policy. And he's currently CEO of PeaceWorks Foundation, a one-voice movement in Palestine and Israel.